Big weekend for the Baltimore Ravens. Really exciting weekend for the Ravens as they look to get back on track against the Denver Broncos. Uh, John Harbaugh did confirm that Marcus Williams will be playing in the game against the Broncos. We'll see if he ends up starting. I kind of think that he will, and maybe this benching will bring a new sense of urgency with Marcus Williams and really the whole Ravens offense. Hopefully it lights a fire under them and lets them know like, hey, it could be you despite your position despite how much you get paid hopefully it sent a message to the entire Ravens defense that ain't nobody safe uh but Zach Orr is still calling the shots and I guess some people still are saying but it's all good he, he gonna get it man he gonna get it together real real soon I mean he ain't got no choice but to turn this thing around because we can't handle no Ravens defense going out like this not every week but anyway um, so Marcus Williams, he's going to be playing. Uh, Deontay Johnson, Harbaugh talked about him as well, said that he'll start making his contributions uh, on Sunday against the Broncos. Uh, could it be as a punt return? I'm sure we'll see him on offense a little bit too. I know him and Lamar Jackson, they will have only had one day of practice, that being Friday. Uh, they may do like a little walkthrough or something, something super light on Saturday, but... They won't have had much practice, but they both from Florida, so that connection is going to be this. I ain't even worried about that, um, but they'll ease Deontay Johnson on in the lineup, but then Keaton Mitchell, ooh, Keaton Mitchell, they, like, he, he going to be coming back real, real soon. Harbaugh didn't confirm anything about this game that we got coming up, but hey, maybe by the time you see this video, they will have added him to the active roster, uh, but if they don't. That's cool, too. We'll see you Thursday, Keaton Mitchell. But we look forward to seeing him real soon because he's been practicing. He's been at every single practice. Lamar Jackson been talking about him. He said, he said that uh, he threw a little short pass to him, and then he took off, and he said, oh, Keaton Mitchell looking like he was looking from last year. And I said, ooh, when I heard that, yeah, because that, oh, my goodness, man. It's going to be crazy, man. This offense just got that much stronger. But what about defense? Defense has obviously been lacking this year. Um, they had some nice moments. They had some nice times where they made some nice plays throughout this entire season. But overall, the defense has been pretty bad, especially pass defense. Run, run defense has been doing their thing, but pass defense has been, oh, my goodness, it's been yikes, rough. But what can they do? What will they do? Well, they're, of course, especially with the trade deadline coming up in a couple of days, I believe, what, Tuesday at 4 p.m. is the deadline. Um, there are a lot of different moves that can still be made but for the Baltimore Ravens in particular um they have a couple of different things that they can do but um let's read this report from Jordan Schultz which would kind of give us a reminder as to why the Baltimore Ravens wouldn't make a move well now or over, over the past couple of days of course uh he said sources several AFC teams have paused trade talk to see where they stand after Sunday's games with so many two win teams in the AFC some aren't ready to give up on their seasons or trade players at a discount Sunday's results will likely tip the scale one way or another before Tuesday's trade deadline so that makes sense cuz some teams out there that's I know it's kind of rough right now, and they may have some players that they may be like, look, our season's over, so we just want to ship them off. But Sunday, they may just get a little glimmer of hope if they win, but if they lose, they could be like, you know what? Burn it all down, fire sale, get rid of everybody, everything must go. So that's why it's so important for the Baltimore Ravens against the Broncos to not only win, but also, just, and the, the win is the most, most important, first and foremost. Them beating the Broncos is most important, but they are going to be monitoring all these other teams. Now, um, there have been rumors about different pass rushes that the Baltimore Ravens could possibly go after. Obviously, it's Darius Smith. He's been a very hot topic. A lot of people have been looking at him like, oh, my goodness, Ravens could reunite with Darius Smith. That would be lovely. Some people have been looking at Calais Campbell for interior defensive line help. He's over there on the Dolphins uh, with a very cheap deal, cheap, affordable deal, especially for the Baltimore Ravens. People have been thinking about him, too. And then there's, of course, the pipe dream with Max Crosby. We know it's not going to go down, but... It would be lovely if it did. But uh, the biggest name, in my opinion, that I would be the most excited about, if it did happen, it would be Jadavian Clowney. Like, Jadavian Clowney, <laughs> he's somebody that, as we know, we saw what he did uh, with the Baltimore Ravens last season. So we know what he's still capable of. And if Jadavian Clowney were to come to the Ravens, like, he ain't really doing too much over there with the uh, – with the the Panthers right now 
But and he went over there because he wanted to be home. He wanted to be close to his family because he got stuff going on with his people. Um, so I wonder if the Baltimore Ravens even approached the Panthers and Jadavian Clowney for a trade. If he would be like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm cool with that. Or if he would be like, no, 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 I, I want to stay here. I, I wonder how that part will work itself out. But um, as far as Jadavian Clowney and the likelihood that he is a Baltimore Raven, that he becomes a Baltimore Raven, well, uh, according to this. Um, the Baltimore Ravens have the best odds to trade for a Jadavian Clowney. Uh, and let's read this article from sportscasting.com. It says, as the 2024 trade deadline approaches, Jadavian Clowney's name is circulating as one of the top potential trade candidates. Clowney currently with the Carolina Panthers has had a solid season, but with Carolina in rebuild mode, they could look to capitalize on his value by trading him to a playoff contender. The Ravens have emerged as the favorites to land the veteran pass rusher, and here's why they, along with other teams, could be in the running for Clowney's services. So, I like it. I like that, like, out of all the pass rush, all, excuse me, out of all the realistic pass rush, you know what, Max Crosby, ooh, they really realistic, but... Out of all the realistic possibilities for a pass rusher, that would be my favorite one right there by far. Uh, it says, the betting odds for Jadavion Clowney's next team, if he's traded this year, uh, the Ravens at the top, then there's, uh, with 52.4%. Then there's the Jets at 28. Then it's the Dolphins at 28. Then the Lions way, way, way down. And the Cleveland Browns way, way, way down too. So it says, Baltimore Ravens the favorites. The Ravens are the most likely destination for Clowney given their current need for depth and experience at edge rusher. Although Clowney has not played under new Ravens defensive coordinator Zach Orr, his success in 2023 with Baltimore under a similar defensive structure makes him an attractive option. Uh, last season, Clowney recorded nine and a half sacks for the Ravens, tying his career high and providing co consistent pressure off the edge. With young players like Adolphe Away and David Ajabo still developing, Clowney would provide valuable leadership and stability to help solidify the Ravens front seven as they push for a deep playoff run, and that's what we want them to push for for sure. So with Jadavion Clowney, I mean, he, they said it all in a nutshell right there. I, I love it. I, I That would be a move that I would be all on board for. Um, they also said adding clowning would also help fill a void for Ravens defense that prides itself on versatility and uh, ability to adapt to different opponents. With his ability to blow, play both against the run and generate pressure in the passing game, Clowney could be a crucial addition as Baltimore looks to make a Super Bowl push. And, yeah, that's exactly the type of addition he was last year. I mean, I wish, I wish they could have kept him, but... The way that this could possibly be facilitated, I mean, they already gave him pretty much all his guaranteed money, the majority of it. So Panthers done paid him a good chunk of his bread. So Ray, all Ravens got to do is you send over that little draft pick or whatever. S send them, send them back the the six that they gave you for Deontay Johnson to get. I know it's probably gonna take a little tiny bit more to get somebody like Jadavian Clown. Well, yeah, maybe it was like a tiny bit more. No, maybe not. Because, again, Panthers, they mess around and lose on. So I don't even know who they plan on Sunday, but I hope that they lose so they can really be like, you know what, Ravens, take them for free. And now we hear my favorite part of these videos where we get to feature your questions. And these are the final questions for the week. And the first one came from my guy Joshua. He said, how we go six and three. What's up, Engraven? Hope you are doing good. I hope your family is doing great mentally and physically. What's up, team? Keep it clean. Hope all of you, your families are doing good mentally and physically. Well, that was a wild loss uh, on last Sunday. A lot of good and a lot of bad. What people don't remember is that the Browns and Steelers are literally built to beat or slow us down on, with their defenses. This email might be long, so sorry in advance. Let's get to it. Yeah, yesterday was, in my opinion, Todd Monken's worst game this year in Lamar's. Even though Lamar played well and winning football, the first half was off a little. A couple of almost interceptions and the missed throw to Zay Flowers. Todd was getting cute and over and over again and overdoing a lot of plays. The Wildcat was a terrible play call. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, put the ball in Lamar's hand or Henry's hands in that situation. Well, they literally put the ball in Henry's hands, but since it was out of the Wildcat, they had him backed up, so it would have took him extra to get those yards back. But anyway, um, he said, could have done a fake toss, a play action of someone, or a real run with Ricard back there blocking for Henry, and if they still stop it, got to get him the credit. That's true. Or could have just took the points, too. He said, the O-line wasn't that good yesterday. Also, a lot of time Lamar had to run out of the pocket to make the miss, uh, but I know the Browns' D-line is nice, so I kind of give them a small pass, but it was mostly 77, Daniel Filele. Uh, which is why I've been given, which is which I have been giving credit to. Uh, he's been doing better since week one and two, but still been wanting to see Cleveland out there. Uh, but Falele just has to get better. But that drive I had the problem with. Uh, well, first, why is Wallace fair catching at the five? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, we did bring that up too when it happened live. I'm like, really, a fair catch from the five? You got to have better awareness than that. He said also. 
We are that far backed up. Why in the world did I not see Henry the whole drive? We signed him to help us finish games and the playoffs. Uh, that sets, excuse me, that's the same drive bait had that drop that was so disappointing and devastating. I understand the sun was shining brightly in his face and he was tripping, but you got to catch that. Speaking about drops, Eddie Jackson, my goodness, man, I put up 1K, my little cousin, who's 10 is catching at least one of those interceptions. I really believe Williams would have caught two of those interceptions. I know he's been playing bad, but, man, we definitely missed him out there. Well, you're going to get to see him uh, tomorrow. Um, I, the defense is very bad. I don't think I've ever seen a crazier drop-off from one season to another. Uh, but for me, Zach Orr has one or two more games, max, to get it together. Uh, he was down our best two cornerbacks. They benched Williams out to depth D lineman and had four drop interceptions. If we would have caught at least one or two of those picks, we win. But I'm going to lose it if he keeps going cover zero for game. Uh, for the game, you're not Mr. Wink. Mr. Orr, you see where Wink is now? You'll be next. Had to get that, had to get that off my chest. Now, with that cover zero at the end of the game where he was just sending that all-out blitz, he did say it was to uh, to take them out of field goal range. Um, now, with that, I think that it actually worked in their favor because um, – what they did, they he sent the blitz. It obviously didn't work out, but I mean, it could work because Kyle, if Kyle Hamilton would have caught that pick, then it's like, oh, we got the ball. And worst case scenario, if we don't get a first down after Kyle Hamilton catches the pick, we drain a lot of clock and they get the ball back with a little bit of time left. Um, but best case scenario, Kyle Hamilton catches the pick, Ravens get a first down, then the game's over. But um, that him going all out blitz, that did allow. Jameis Winston and them and the Browns to get a touchdown. So since they got that touchdown, the Ravens had a good amount of time to move. The, they had 59 seconds left to move the ball down the field. And as we saw, Lamar Jackson, that Ravens offense, they don't need much time. If, if, if they got to push the ball downfield, they can push the ball downfield. And that's what I love about this offense, man. But anyway, um, so it, it, it almost worked. So it almost worked. Uh, it the, it put the the Ravens in position for their offense to go out there and win the game, even though it was up up against some tough circumstances. But they almost still got it done. But anyway, um, continuing, he said next week is the Broncos. They might be another trap game. We have to watch out for future Raven Cortland Sutton. LOL. Uh, he's their best player on offense, and we got to stop the run and watch fourteen in the tight ends. Their defense is good this year. They're going to blitz a lot, and they tackle well. We have to watch out for PS two, their best defensive player, and twenty nine, their nickel corner who is playing lights out for them, and also fifty five. So we got to run the ball back to normal this week and efficient throws like usual. Finally, my question to you is: What realistic trades and moves? Would you make to fix the defense? Oh, well, we, we started off this video with answering that question, baby. Then um, he said, thanks for reading my long email, LOL. Until next week. He said, also, I just got the notification that the Chiefs traded for Josh Uche. They are going all in, and it's crazy. The league wants the Chiefs to do a three-peat for a six is crazy. But, hey, Raven's about to stop all of that. Next question came from my guy, Jonathan. He said, hey, Raven, hope all is well. I know when we are winning games, the questions from subscribers get minimized. And I can imagine not many questions are sent because we're winning. Everything and all issues that concern the Ravens are not set as priority. Why? Because it's all hidden by us winning games. As soon as we lose, everything breaks loose. Fans and all Flock Nation are, in a frenzy, are on a frenzy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's what we always say. Uh, and we've been talking about that for years, uh, especially, obviously, in particular with the Ravens, that winning, but you can apply this to any team, really, though. Uh, but well, not the Chiefs. Not the Chiefs, though, because you see they undefeated and they still went and got a DeAndre Hopkins. You see they undefeated and they still went and got a Josh Usher. You see they still undefeated. They, probably, they tried to get a Cooper Cup. That was obviously before DeAndre Hopkins, but Chiefs, they undefeated. They've been winning, but they still like, man, we got holes here, there, everywhere. Well, let's try to plug those up. So... Well, we've been saying for years that winning covers everything. Winning covers up everything. A lot of people can get lost in the sauce of winning, which is understandable because it's like, hey, we winning, we making this happen, our team's doing great, la, 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 la. The problems on us, oh, the problems ain't no big deal. We still winning. But it's important, even when you're winning, and it's not even nitpicking, but even when you're winning to still look at ways you can get even better. But anyway, continuing, he said, um, sit back because this is going to be a long one. Yeah, it, it it, it really is. Uh, he said, um, offense wins games, defense wins championships. We are 5-3 and three halfway through the season. I can say offense is doing a great job of winning us some games. Through eight weeks, offense has stepped up big time. O-line has been great. We can see them starting to build con continuity and jail with one another. 
they I wouldn't say they've been great. Um, I, I'll say they they've been better though overall, especially now the first two weeks started. He said, "Great job of adjusting. Offense ranked in the top ten of all offensively. Uh, so it's safe to say our offense is elite. Last game against the Browns, we had issues with receivers dropping passes. So what the Ravens do? Are we going to get Deontay Johnson? Ultimately, on paper, huge upgrade from Nelly and Bateman. As you like to say in Graven, we strengthen what we already have strength in. Meaning our offense is elite. So we go and add a guy to our already strong offense. So what's next? Defense, right? Okay." Uh, as we know, through eight weeks, we don't have a championship defense point blank, period. Better yet, our defense and special teams is what are go what is going to hold us back uh, in this Lamar Jackson era from winning a championship. So what do we need? Trade for Buda Baker. Give them Marcus Williams with a third round and a fifth round and maybe a 2026 fourth round. Oh, you ready to really get Buda Baker? You wanted to get them off offer they can't refuse. So giving them Marcus Williams. So Ravens will still be paying him a lot of money. So he just... Ready to offload Marcus Williams uh, and get him a third and fifth rounder and maybe a 2026 fourth round. Oh, my goodness. He re you really all in on Buda Baker. Hey, I hope Marcus Williams in that game tomorrow. I really hope he show out because if he don't, but, but I hope he show out and just really just reignite the, 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 the flame with Ravens fans, the good flame with Ravens fans with him. And just really, he get a lot of love from him. Cause I, and I know that's tough in, in this business. I get it. Uh, and I know it ain't nothing personal with Ravens fans. It's just they, they want their team to be the best as he possibly can. And I, I get that. But um, hopefully Marcus Williams in, in a game against the Broncos, he just goes crazy with it in a good way. Um, anyway, he said, do all to bring him in. Oh, yeah, I can tell you really ready to give up everything to bring in Buda Baker. He said, to fix an issue, we need to address it. Think about it. How will Marcus Williams be after this benching? How will he be in the locker room? Would he play better? How will the secondary and the team defense as a whole play after seeing what Marcus went through? We about to find that out real soon. Uh, not to mention, he's a high-paid safety, and for the previous years, he's been here. He's played great outside of injuries. Yeah, that's been the part right there, though, the injuries. Uh, anyway, Buda Baker will be a huge upgrade, high IQ player, and with his playing style, he'll be, he will complement Super Duper Kyle well. He can blitz, he can cover, he can tackle, and best of all, he can play single high. Uh, next, cut Eddie Jackson. <laughs> oh, man, I, I don't think there will be one Raven fan that will disagree with you. But um, it seems like Ravens are really going to give him a shot. Anyway, he said, oh, Darius Washington is playing lights out. He can be that third safety in nickel corner. Now, I do agree with that. I, I do. Uh, uh, Darius Washington uh, would be better in that role than Eddie Jackson right now. Eddie Jackson just been from jump this season. He's been struggling big time from jump literally all season long. Um, so anyway, he said, we have Bo Braden and Sanusi Kane as depth. Now, how great it would be to have two young safeties learning from two all pro safeties with Kyle and Buddha. Will it fix our defensive problems? Maybe not right away. However, it's a start. Now, Ravens flock, Ravens Nation, and Raven, and everyone else. Uh, question for everyone Do you think that our defensive woes and miscommunications and our defensive failures is Zach or or personnel, front or back office, or just the 11 players on defense themselves? Let's look deeper. Well, I, I said it's, it's scheme. So I guess that would be on the hands of Zach Orr. But anyway, he said, Zach Orr played linebacker for the Ravens from 2014 to 2016. It was a top 10 defense. He was hired as a defensive analyst for the Ravens in 2017 to 2020. Uh, defensive coordinators at the time were Dean Pease, Wink Martindale, which was which was ranked third, first, ninth, first as a defense with those years. Then the Jaguars hired him in 2021 as an outside linebackers coach. Defensive coordinator was Joe Cullen, who is part of the Ravens staff and is currently Chiefs defensive line coach as of today. Then back to the Ravens in 2022. Hired as the inside linebackers coach, defensive coordinator at the time was Mike McDonald, was ranked fourth and then first as defense. And now our current defensive coordinator is Zach Orr. What's my point? Zach Orr has been through all the ups and downs as a player and position coach from this Baltimore Ravens defense. He's seen firsthand, better yet, being under the same umbrella and close with Dean Pease, Wink Martindale, and Mike McDonald through their ups and downs. Now that he's been promoted in-house, uh, promotion at that I, I know he's well equipped for this position so is or to blame for the defensive collapse let's look at our losses versus the Chiefs the defense got a, a key three and out with two minutes left in the game versus the Raiders yes he could have done a better job adjusting however our DBs got destroyed uh, versus the Browns again our DBs could have ended the game with interceptions yes no Marlon Humphrey yes no Wiggins but yet or is putting these players in position to make plays but we are getting outplayed I'm looking at everyone's body language from Matabike to away uh, to Ajabo being a healthy scratch, to Williams getting benched, Roquan looking sluggish and hesitant at times. You can see when Zach Orr sends the play and the play call is in, but once we break the huddle, you can see some guys 
are confused on what they're doing. Perfect example, every time the middle of the field is wide open or the running back is running down the flats, wide open, whenever the camera goes to the sideline, you can see the reaction of the coaches. Like, why isn't this person in their spot type of look? On top of that, you can see the whole defense is playing hesitant. That's why our DBs are getting cooked. Marlowe is playing carefree. You can tell that's why he's having some success. It's never been noticed. Why? Because we're winning games. Super Duper Kyle is playing great, and you can tell he understands the defense. Kyle Vanoy, you can tell he understands the playbook. He's where he needs to be with his rush angles and setting the edge. Better yet, at times, you can see he's aligning guys. Where is our green dot all pro defensive play caller and leader, Roquan Smith? Better yet, he's not even aligning everyone to their spots like he was last year. Yes, we have a different D.C. Language is different from McDonald. Yes, he has a new teammate next to him with Simpson. But as the middle linebacker play caller, you should know the playbook. When our middle of the field man is confused, it makes our back in confused which affects our pass rush to build a championship defense pass rush and coverage goes hand in hand when i watch the games i'm looking at everyone and these are the little things i notice so who's to blame is it zach or the players themselves for not understanding the playbook sorry engraving this is probably the longest one that i've sent you forgive me yes ew. Woo! wow i man that was wow it, it was good though it was good my phone is getting ready to die it has two percent left so just go ahead and let that do, let that die. Um, but yeah, uh, that is something that's very interesting. Uh, and I know with Jack Settlement, who is Marlon Humphrey's host slash co-host on the Punchline podcast, the other day he was tweeting, and he was saying that he knows some stuff. I mean, obviously he, he talked to Marlon Humphrey all the time. They they business partners and whatnot. Um, but he said that um, it's not Zach Orr. He was saying the issue, the real issue is he didn't say what it is, but he just said what it's not. Because he said he's tired of seeing all these people blame Zach or Zach or Zach or, but Zach or is not the issue. Um, he didn't allude to it being a specific coach or player or anything like that, but I, I did appreciate uh, my guy Jonathan his question and his breakdown because uh, he talked about Zach or and all his experience, where he's been at and whatnot. Um, now, it's different because before he was behind the scenes, linebacker coach did all that stuff. It's different when you actually the one calling the place. It's much different. Um, but... I know a big culprit this year has been Roquan Smith, and we all said it from jump that you could tell like he just looks off. He looks stuck. It, could it be him really impacting this entire defense like that? When you break it down the way that you did, especially when he got the green dot, he the one relegating the place to everybody and whatnot, he could be a big part of it too. Um, but I just – that's something to watch out for. That That is something that's, that's, that, that, that is going to be interesting to watch for in this Broncos game, um, how Roquan Smith is because he's a leader. He's he's the leader of this defense. He's been the leader of this defense for the past what, what has it been like two and a half years, I think. Um, but with him, uh, yeah, this year a lot of time he just he just hasn't looked too good. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just I'm I'm really confused. I'm really confused on what the exact issue is with this defense. Again, I, I still think it's scheme. Um, I I've been somebody that said I don't think it's personnel. Like how can all these guys who were pretty good last year, they just take this immediate drop. And all of them are struggling. All of them are underperforming. All of them are doing bad. Well, not all of them, but 99% of them are just, it's rough out there. All of a sudden. And like, I, I know Denard Wilson left, the, the DB coach. Obviously, Mike McDonald left, too. He was our, our defensive coordinator. Anthony Weaver. He, but to go from first to worst... Hopefully we get some answers soon. New talent. Next question came from my guy, Alberti. He told me, he said, uh, the Ravens front office is going to open up the checkbook to bolster their linebacking core and secondary. Historically, the Ravens have been eager to invest on defense. And with that, while a stout opportunistic group as a whole, the defense has specific holes beyond the linebacker play of Roquan Smith. See, a lot of people are really in tune with that, huh? He said, while Kyle Hamilton is excellent in coverage, he is schemed as more of a hybrid in the box safety slash linebacker where he is most versatile and effective. This means that the Ravens use a hybrid nickel boasting an extra defensive back and one less linebacker most effective when you have a worthwhile slot corner. Only four men are dedicated to rush the pass or creating massive gaps if linebackers are forced to support in rushing. Be it that Kyle Hamilton is now forced to blitz more and support Roquan Smith inside since the departure of Patrick Queen. The formation leaves Smith and Hamilton at a disadvantage to start the play. Ultimately, uh, the Ravens' best players truly are playing out of their element and opposing offensive coordinators are scheming to tax these vulnerabilities, uh, like a Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, the young secondary behind uh, a phenomenal but in injury-prone Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Williams is young and susceptible, uh, while the pass rush does them no favors. Trent Simpson is a solid bridge player, but the Ravens must rescue their pedigree at outside linebacker. Historically, the Ravens have always had Pro Bowl caliber players, 
at middle linebacker and outside linebacker in tandem since the inception of the Ravens. For example, Peter Bowie, Ray Lewis, Darren Sharper complete the first linebacker core. Soon after, Ray Lewis bought Scott, Jared Johnson, Terrell Suggs, eventually to Ray Lewis, Terrell Suggs, Elvis Dumaville, C.J. Mosey, Daryl Smith, uh, and Zadarius Smith. It's safe to say that beyond drafting Patrick Queen, the Ravens have made a clear philosophy change after paying top market value for Roquan Smith and leaving him on an island. Here are a few trade targets plausible for the Ravens based on market cap, tank seasons, and discounted value for significant role players. So Darius Smith and Jadavian Clowney have already had success in Baltimore and would be the ideal choice for our style of play, costing little against the cap, with both Panthers and Browns among serious financial uh, and team building overhaul with focus on the draft and getting younger. There go Jadavian Clowney. That'd be my choice. So I agree. With it. Anyway, he said, Mr. DeCosta recently re signed Yannick Ngakwe, making a return stint with the Ravens very feasible. Uh, the addition of either of these players will not only improve the pass rush, but drastically support the linebackers in secondary. That's true, because a good pass rush can help make everybody's job behind them a lot easier. Uh, he said, um, da -da 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 -da. Oh, though I don't think the Browns would be as eager to let this next player go, Greg Newsom may also be on the table due to the ridiculous cap hit sustained by an unavailable Deshaun Watson. Greg Newsom has proven to be a stingy, sticky, consistent cornerback, and the Ravens have been known to pony up for secondary help in the past. Yeah, I, I don't see the, the Browns letting him go. Greg Newsom, well, he number zero, right? It was him and somebody else in that Browns game who, oh, I already respect. I respect everybody, but they really earn respect because um, him and somebody else. Was it 23? I forgot the number, but they went head up. Well, not, well, not head up with Derrick Henry, but they tackled him high, and they brought him down. Like, they tackled him high. They ain't even just grabbed the They tackled him high. And I was, when I saw that, I said, whoa, because it's just weird to see stuff like that. Anyway, he said this move will not only uh, relieve the secondary issues, it would additionally aid the pass rush with the more time to get after the quarterback. Moving past the trade scenarios, I think the Ravens have three viable options in free agency to address the cornerback position. The option with the highest ceiling but the most expense is surely J.C. Jackson. He's a free agent. Worthy of the money, this could be the last piece of the puzzle for the Ravens. As much, a much less expensive option with the potential for a return to phenom form whenever he wears black and purple is Marcus Peters. Ooh, no, no, that's... Yeah, that ain't happening. You know. I definitely ain't happening. You know. He said he always added an edge to the Ravens secondary and seemingly played his best ball with the Ravens. Who do you think the Ravens will take, or will they take nobody at all? Um, I think they will look at Darius Smith, but I feel like the Browns they would. I, I feel like the Browns would rather take a less offer from somebody else to not trade him within the division to help the Ravens out. So I, I really still do think. Um, while he is not only my favorite, but I think it's the most. A uh, realistic choice for the Baltimore Ravens would be Jadavian Clowney.